we have Leonardo Di Donato. Thanks, Thanks Leo. Leo. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? OK. OK, so I know there are a lot of buts words in uh, this title, and this slide probably is a mess. But please keep calm, because during this talk, we are going to sort out all of them. And uh, basically, we learn some new things about BPFs, Kubernetes, probably Kubernetes not, but about BPFs for sure. And uh, particularly, we will learn how to put the, these pieces together in the nowadays cloud native world, which means uh, that this talk wants to expose the idea and the reference implementation with probably a demo if we have time. Uh, that I'll present later, of using a BPFs as a source of information to allow the collection of uh, metrics about our applications running on Kubernetes cluster, but without even touching the applications, which means that, uh, different from the usual approach where we instrument Prometheus, things like that, uh, tracers, inside of our applications logic with custom code and custom libraries, we want to achieve this, the, the same output, but without even touching the applications, so using a BPF. So, uh, as I said at the end, there will be a demo. Since the demo is a bit long, I already prepared everything to, to look at the results. And, and uh, just for fun, we will show like, like some Grafana dashboards uh, containing the data put in, into Prometics from ABPF running on Kubernetes. So yeah, it's a, a bit... Uh, <laughs> A mess. Anyway, before doing this, let me spend like 30 minutes, no, I'm joking, 10 seconds presenting myself. I'm Leonardo Di Donato. I'm uh, in the office of the CTO at Sysdig, and I work there like an open source software engineer, where currently I mainly take, take care of Falco, which is the runtime tool for container native security of CNCF. In the meantime, uh, during nights when I want to ruin my life, I create tools Lately, I'm creating tools about the BPFs, for example, QBC Triad Trace with a friend of mine, and uh, KubeBPF, which is the experiment that gave birth to this talk, which is basically an, an operator, a Kubernetes operator for running whatever BPF on Kubernetes clusters, and, and others. So, as said, the, the whole point of this talk is about grabbing the events, about doing this at the lowest possible point in the stack, which means, namely, in the kernel in the Linux kernel, because the kernel now knows a lot more of our applications, is on a completely different level. And uh, so our idea is to go there to ask for the information that we need to monitor our applications. So uh, just to give you an example to speak concretely, uh, we can go there asking to trace all the Exec via syscalls that are uh, the syscalls in the Linux kernel that our applications are, uh, are running without even touching our uh, applications. Uh, just, uh, just think about today, everyone talks about monitoring, observability, events, metrics, and things like that. And uh, I don't want to be rude, but uh, what this result, this result in often, not I don't want to generalize, but in the majority of the case, this results only in having data lakes, a lot of data that you have to pay to store with no value, no meaningful, no meaningfulness. You do, you do nothing. You say, oh, I do monitoring. I have these terabytes of data, and I do literally nothing with them. So um, we, really, we rather want to be able to uh, punctually uh, col uh, collect and detect the data that we want and just and doing, doing this with a minimum uh, performance overhead possible at, at the lowest, pos at the lowest possible uh, level in the stack. So uh, I'm talking about using Linux monitoring capabilities, Linux kernel monitoring capabilities to gain container visibility. How to do this? OK. Uh, to our aid for this scope, a new technology has uh, recently uh, came. This technology is called ABPF, which stands for Extended Barclay Packet Filters. To be honest, uh, Barclay Packet Filters, BPF, not ABPF, is not that uh, young. It's not recent. It, it's like it originates in 1992 when it was created like a Linux system to basically monitor and uh, detect 
uh, to do things about only packets, network packets. Now it has been rebranded like extended because it's not more about packets only. You can trace almost everything in a Linux, in a, in a Linux subsystem with the uh, ABPF. Uh, to give you an example, someone here, I have ever used TCP filter expressions, TCP dump. Yeah, he used the BPF. Because TCP uh, filter expression got compiled in the BPF bytecode, which is then uh, put into the kernel and attached to the raw uh, network packet flow, giving back to you, to the user space, only the packets that meet the filtering criteria not all the packets, and then you do the filtering at user space level. The kernel directly do, does the filtering and gives back all the packets that you need. That's, that's an example of BPF. Uh, a lot of other tools uh, like D-Trace, monitoring tools, tracing tools are being rewritten, are, are being currently rewritten like uh, a BPF front end. So using BPF in the kernel and being front ends of, of that. Um, so I said, a BPF, uh, ABPF is the extended version of, of, uh, of this. So when you think about this, uh, also, I mean, personally, this has happened to me. I asked, so why we are not using ABPF to gain uh, our metrics at the lowest possible level? Why uh, we don't go gather uh, data uh, there? Why we have to clog our applications domain, our applications code with third-party external libraries uh, that ruining our life? Because when, when you put, when you, that there is a problem in, in the, this approach, in the typical approach that we have when we create instrument monitoring for, uh, for our uh, applications. We go inside our applications, we have to know the domain of the application, the logic of the application, we have to change that logic, and we create a man maintainability problem. Because in the future, I mean applications are alive, they change in time. You need to change the things that you monitor, you need to go again inside them, changing code, changing logic, grabbing other metrics. With the BPF, we can do all this outside without even touching the application. We don't have to release them again, we don't have to change the code inside them, and things like that. So, a BPF is a very flexible, also because a BPF is a very, very flexible system. As I said, it's capable of tracing almost anything in, in, in our, uh, in our in the Linux kernel. You ranging from CPU scheduler to memory manager, networking, row syscalls, uh, block device requests, everything. So uh, let's talk about a bit about the BPF. I'll, be sh I'll, I'll try to be short, I, I promise. But uh, the, the revolution of the BPF is basically that you can attach custom compiled and sandboxed bytecode to, uh, to virtually every function that is in the Linux kernel symbol table. And with uh, doing this, you don't, have to do, you, don't, you don't have the fear anymore of breaking your kernel. And maybe someone worked with the Linux kernel models here. And if you worked with the Linux kernel models, you probably experienced the terrifying kernel panics, <laughs> like uh, every 10 minutes. And so uh, with the BPF, this is not possible anymore because uh, the way that BPF is done, BPF is uh, bytecode. It's running a safe register-based virtual machine, which is a, 60, a custom 64-bit RISC inst uh, instruction set, directly running it into the kernel. And there is a verifier that verifies, for example, that your BPF code does not contain invalid pointer references, does not exceed ma maximum call stack, does not uh, loop indefinitely, which means that you, it's not Turing complete. You can loop only if the loops that you use in the BPF are bounded, up, the upper bound is known at, at compile time. So th this is useful to, be, to, to have this uh, safe sandboxed uh, virtual machine that runs a BPF and to have the guarantee that cannot exist any BPF program that exhausts your system resources. And so uh, other, other good points of using a BPF for doing uh, such tasks uh, about server monitoring and container visibility is the fact that uh, basically a BPF is in the Linux core, does not introduce any third party dependencies, and uh, it imposes a stable API, which also means that you can uh, use programs written for older kernels on newer kernels. When you have a stable application binary interface, this is the, what happens. Also, Last but not least, the performance uh, overhead of the BPF is basically 
and most of all of the times negligible. It's, it, it seems like to, to, to not happen. It's because we will see now because the, the reason because this is this is true. Just to, to give you some other examples, for example, imagine that you want to detect the arrival of a particular kind of a packet, network packet. You can do it with a, with a kind of BPF called XDP, Express Data Path. And you can filter, for example, for TCP packets, UDP. You can create like your own with the XDP, with BPF XDP, your own uh, traffic shapers, so meshes. Like you send all the packets to the local host, and in the packets there is some some flag to to specify where you want to sit. And the XDP, the ABPF program, which is not running in a process, is running directly in the in the in the kernel. Looking at that flag, knows oh, okay these have to go to that cluster rather than this other cluster. So you can create things like that without having nothing at application level. So like completely transparent. And um, you can do also, for example, you can track, you, maybe you have a, share, a shared library, which exposes some function. You can track with <laughs> probes the other piece of your applications calling that shared library. You can track uh, the invocation and the parameters uh, of the invocation of uh, libraries with your probes. You can track the execution of kernel, root, uh, kernel routines at specific memory address with key probes. You can do this sort of magic tricks. Uh, and so, uh, before, so how does a BPF work? This, this diagram, I put this diagram here to help people understand what I just said. Basically, imagine you have some BPF source, so C code. Luckily, we, we have the Clang compiler that taps up. Uh, Clang is a part of the LL from, uh, LLVM front ends. Helps us compile that BPF code uh, without uh, without having us to juggling with the raw BPF instruction set directives. When you have this, comp this compiled BPF, this object file, basically uh, you have its ELF. ELF is the, the format, a standard format to, to represent shared libraries, objects, and uh, you, you are ready to load this into the kernel. To do this, you have to use the BPF syscall. B the BPF syscall, which seems uh, a simple syscall, uh, in reality, uh, does a lot of other things, like, for example, set up the, the maps. Maps, for example, I will talk soon about them. Uh, is, uh, BPF maps, in my opinion, is the most compelling feature of a BPF, which is probably the most compelling technology for the future in, in, in our field. Uh, because maps are a mechanism to basic, basically, they are an internal key value store uh, already. In, oh, and you can work with it asynchronously. <coughs> and this, the, they come to the rescue to, mon, to, to share data between kernel space and user space. So that maps are the mechanism to send back and forth data, for example, the metrics that we, we want to gather from the kernel to, to the user space. And BPF Cisco does this apart from loading the BPF file, the object file. When the BPF uh, is loaded, there is the verifier I was talking before. It does a lot that, that it verifies the, the, the invalid point of the references, if there are or not, uh, other, other, other cool things. And then uh, he basically uh, pass the ball to, to the internal of the virtual machine, which compiles, in, real, in reality, they just in time compiles, translate to machine code, the BPF code. The cool thing is, is that uh, that piece translates the codes to the target architecture that you need. This means that the resulting codes will be very, very fast. If for some reason you don't have in your setup the just-in-time compiler, or the just-in-time compiler of BPF, it will fall, fall back to the interpreter. And we all know that interpreters are slower. But in the majority of cases, you will just go in time compile the BPF. And its resulting code will be very, very fast. So I, uh, what else? Ah, I put there. Uh, the usual uh, way to interact with BPF maps, I mean, create, look up, update element, and a link where you can uh, see all the kind of BPF maps. There are hash tables, there are arrays, there, there are a, a various range of BPF maps. The same way we have a various range of BPF program types or backends, like I, I say the XDP, uh, trace points, U probe, key probes, and there is the link where you, if you're curious, you can have a look. There are a lot of them. And they are extending. They are becoming more and more and more. 
So, to wrap up, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a BPF? Okay, uh, first of all, we have a unified tracing interface. Having a unified, safe, widely available framework is always a good thing because you can build and integrate other tools on top of that. In fact, nowadays, as I said, D-Trace, uh, system, system Tap, uh, Perf, uh, are being currently now rewritten as BPF frontends. So they are using the BPF framework and they are being rewritten as a, on top of that. BPF is even driven. This is a, a cool thing for, for a lot of user cases, use cases about monitoring. For example, I said you maybe want to detect an event, a packet that arrives, and you can do it. It's, they are completely event driven, and more, what, what's more is that they are fully programmable. When you, for example, use Perf, you can do your extraction of data, you can uh, run Perf, and you obtain your data, but then you have to process them. With the BPF, since the BPF is code, you can do this, that while you also do the extract, so you do the, let's, let's say this way, you do the query towards the kernel, you get the data, a BPF is C code, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to get that, that data statically, process it, and so this is the reason that it's, it fits the monitoring use cases. Um, they can trace everything in a system. That, I mean, there are a lot of other tools out there, but they are very specific usually. They can trace that thing, that part of the Linux kernel, that other. A BPF can, a BPF can trace uh, everything. They are not limited to a specific application. And so, uh, and they are very, very fast because of the just-in-time compiler. Then, the, clearly, as everything on this art, there are disadvantages. Nothing is perfect. The disadvantages at the, moment, at the moment are that PPF is not yet as portable as other tracers. And this is because basically the BPF virtual machine is primarily de de developed in the, in the Linux kernel. And there are some, for example, BSD is thinking to do a part of the BPF virtual machine, but it's in the making, it's not completed yet. So uh, you need a fairly recent kernel which imposes a strong uh, limitation on the use of the BPF if you work, for example, with CentOS 6, CentOS 3, CentOS 4, but, okay. And um, they are definitely not for debugging because a BPF are, as I said, just in time compiled. They don't require to stop the execution for a long time. They, they don't give you the information that typical debuggers done for debugging give, give to you. They give you other things. So, uh, what else? I don't remember, still not possible. Okay, I said, probably I said everything. Uh, ah, the, the last thing is that basically, uh, since the initial BPF implementation, 1992, not the extended one, is completely in the kernel, runs in the kernel, every time you instrument an BPF, you have a context switch between kernel and user space. And this, is, this can be a problem when you want to use a BPF to monitor a very, very, very critical uh, performance, critical application. I mean, things not common, things that probably you work one time in, in, a, in a life. So let's look at some, uh, I have to go down, I don't see from here. Let's go down here. These are two uh, BPFs, two BPF types. One to count the packets, uh, basically putting the, the packets of a BPF that arrives uh, by protocol. And this is to trace but the, the C center writes is called, called by our applications on a Kubernetes cluster. You can find this, this script in the BPF tools slash kubbpf project uh, on uh, GitHub. Okay, the video is not perfect, but I want to highlight the SEC is a macro which we will use later uh, in this project to understand from the ELF, from the compiled BPF, the name of the, the map and the name of the function to call to get the data to put into the map. As you can see, for example here, we grab the PID of the process, we look up if there is already that PID or not, and depending on this, we increment the counter. So basically we will end up having a map a PID, number of, of what that, that PID called the C center right. And that other, in that other case, we do the same thing, but for protocol. We have the packet, we extract the protocol, we look up the protocol in the keys of the hash map, if the, and then we count 
we count the, the number of packets by protocol. So we have these two BPFs. And let's start uh, going towards our demo. Why not? Why we don't put this BPF into our Kubernetes cluster to count the packets that our applications running on it are receiving? And why? I mean, Kubernetes is, is everywhere and will be worse in the future. ABPF is eating the world, literally. And uh, so let, let's conjugate the two things together. How to do it? Let's start simple. This is the, let, this is the key sub, keep it simple approach. Imagine that you have, uh, you see that image, Calavera XX Snoop? is a Docker image containing an ABPF loader for an ABPF program, which basically tracks the, the execution of XX syscall. So if you want to deploy this on Kubernetes, you can do it. The important thing is to share the process namespace so that, the, so that the, this container can have the same process, the, the same namespace of the company app. The company app is the app that you want to monitor the XX on. And so you clearly you have to share the kernel leaders for BPFs. Okay. And this is the simplest approach you can use to deploy any BPF on Kubernetes. I mean, it's, it's simple. I don't like it because it's too simple. But <laughs> you can use it. Uh, in, case, in case you want something more generic like me, uh, you, can, you can start thinking on how to generalize this process. So the pieces that we need is we need something able to read the object, the compiled object of a BPF, extract the name of the maps, the kind of the maps, and if we, if we come back here, you can see BPF map type hash with the key int and value int, and same thing to the other. You can extract, we need to extract the, the name of the functions, understand which kind of functions are and to which kind of BPF program type to attach. For example, we, we need to understand, we need to detect the fact that these have to be attacked to static trace, static trace points, while these have to be attacked to socket filters. And so if we have these pieces, we can build a generic operator for Kubernetes able to basically given whatever BPF, deploy it on your uh, Kubernetes cluster to monitor your, the applications running in it. And also because, uh, as I said, the, the, the scope of this, 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 this experiment and the, the talk that uh, has followed was to grab metrics using a BPF and not using uh, instrument and code, punctual code in our applications. So, uh, Let's talk about this BPF operator for Kubernetes. Uh, clearly, these are as disadvantages, at least for me. I hate YAML, and so uh, we what are what are we doing? We are basically getting a BPF C code, compiling it, and transforming it into YAML to deploy it on Kubernetes. We need a, a custom resource definition for a BPF controllers. We need to create an operator that, given this custom custom resource that represents a BPF, deploys it. And the price to pay is YAML. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, you all know what uh, basically a Kubernetes operator is, but these are the three main pieces of a Kubernetes operator. And it's OK? Thank you. So. I tried to, in this diagram, I tried to, to design the, the, the plan that we have. We have to build a BPF runner, which is a Docker image with a program inside, able to read our ELF file of the BPF, understand where the map are, how they are called, the, which kind of map they are, uh, understand uh, which is the function to call for a BPF and to which kind of a BPF attach. And when the, the BPF runner have understood all of this, he starts to tie things together to the Kubernetes. Clearly inside the BPF run, I have to load the BPF. So this is me while fighting with YAML. With the, if you find yourself fighting with YAML tabs, go on that website, 
there's a huge movement in the world against the AMO. <laughs> so, uh, to, to come back, you can compile your BPF if you want. For example, you can get the files that I showed before. You can compile them with that client command. You will, you will obtain, a, for example, a dot .o file. You can use readalf on that dot .o file to, for example, notice the pieces that we are interested, interested in. For example, the, the BPF runner of BPF tools basically does the same thing. It reads elf and go there, reading, oh, there is a dummy map. I need that. It's that kind of map. Oh, there is that function. It's a trace point function. I have to attach to a, tra to a static trace point. And same thing for the socket program. I have to attach that to a socket filter. And uh, I want to spend like two words on license and version. These are tricky, tricky controversial things, particularly the license one. The license section in the BPF, um, basically in the BPF prog load, there's a wrapper that checks that your BPF has a license which is GP GPL compatible, otherwise it will not work. You can spend hours debugging it, there's no even a line, no even a log saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I need a, a BPF code which is GPL lic lic licensed. If you don't put that, that license GPL, you're fucked up. You're fucked. You, <laughs> they will not work. And the version one is basically uh, a macro, a section in the BPF program to say, uh, please use the, last, the, running, the current running kernel, just that. So this is our lo lovely YAML generated with the, the BPF custom resource uh, there. You can see bpf.sh v1 alpha 1, which links back to a configuration, which is a piece of uh, fucking YAML containing a binary object, which contains the encoded ALF. That ALF, that series of uh, characters, is our BPF compiled and encoded. Same thing, we do the same thing for the other file. Clearly, the tool does this automatically. I put here the, the, and we are ready, basically, to do it. This will be the results. I, I don't know how many time I have, but I would like to show you maybe some code. Eight minutes, okay, it's okay. So basically, oh, okay. This is the operator. Uh, I was talking off to achieve all this. For example, there's the loader, which is the part of, uh, responsible for reading the health file, reading the maps and the things. It's written in Go, so it's not difficult to. Basically, here inside, the get map attribute, the, there are a, a series of functions that, given a, that encoded the part in the YAML, it decodes, reads maps, reads the same thing that I did in that screenshot, and basically passes this, passes this information to a map collector, which is responsible to using, for example, go routines to get the value from eBPF maps and put and send them to, to Prometheus. To have our demo. To, to, to give a sense of our team, I already created a Kubernetes cluster here with three nodes, and I deployed on it uh, like a Prometheus operator, the Prometheus itself, and the Grafana, and then finally a BPF uh, a monitoring services, which makes uh, Prometheus able to automatically discover the BPF services. Because when the operator starts and you apply, for example, you do packets.yaml, which contains the packets uh, BPF, kubectl apply uh, packets, and the BPF operator, the kubebpf operator basically creates a daemon set for that uh, YAML BPF, let's call it like that, and a service. And uh, the Prometheus needs a monitoring service to discover that service. Let me open the terminal, one sec. I don't see nothing here. Okay, these are okay. These are the custom resources that we have, the custom resources for a BPF. Okay, then we can take a look at the services. There's these services, which links back to a daemon set, which contains that config containing the BPF. 
go CTL get and points. I need the port. I don't remember the port. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's forward one second upon. So we have that program about counting packets deployed on, a, on our Kubernetes cluster on Digital Ocean. And this getting metrics from ABPF. So it's counting packets for our cluster. For example, here is, is saying that he received like 8 million TCP packets and E101 is ECMP. There are no UDP here. This is strange to me. And other, other protocols that we don't know. <laughs> but you basically, we basically can come back to the slides if I'm able to use my mouse and look at the results, at the aggregated results. OK. As I said, these are the metrics that we end up having. This is what we were seeing, uh, seeing right, right now. We have three nodes of this. And this is the result in Grafana, where we basically have the rate of packets, uh, an histogram representing the amount of packets, for example, TCP, EDP, UDP packets. And basically, we did it. We did it without even touching nothing on the cluster. I mean, everything else on that cluster have, have been not touched. And we are able to, clearly, this is a dummy example. Then you can filter. You can filter for application. You can filter for pod and, and ask, oh, how many packets the, that pod has received? Or for example, in, the, in this image, uh, in the image on the, on the right here, you can see that there are two nodes receiving a, a similar amount of packets. And another one, which is not receiving that, you can, you can segment things more, with more granularity. And this is just a two example. So if you want to contribute, if you want to look more, this is the project on GitHub, BPF Tools, KubeBPF. If you are interested in more BPF and Kubernetes uh, magics, you can go take a look at KubeCTL Trace, which is similar but different. It's not an operator. It's a KubeCTL plugin that I made with a friend of mine, which uh, makes, makes you run BPF Trace programs on your, on your clusters directly from the KubeCTL. So you can do KubeCTL, Trace, uh, pass the, the .bt file, which is a, an abstraction over the BPF. You don't have to write C in this case. You can write BPF trace language, which is a language of the IOVISOR organization in the Linux Foundation. Or you can, you can go take a look at Falco. Falco is the tool I'm working on right now. It's a tool to basically detect and monitor security threats on uh, cloud native environments. And it does, it can work with a kernel module for older uh, setups. And for newer setups, it, it works with an, uh, BPF, with the BPFs. So we use BPF maps to configure and a similar mechanism to send, send back data to the, to the user space. So the takeaways, what are the takeaways? So, okay. Prometheus, we all know Prometheus. Soon we will have open metric, which is better than Prometheus in, in a lot of sense. But this is not to talk, uh, to, to talk about it. And uh, with the BPF, we can trace almost anything in our applications. Uh, they are basically uh, run in a safer, a safe uh, virtual machine. So you, you cannot break your kernel. Your kernel ELF is a cool uh, standard format to representing object files and shared libraries because, because it helps us to understand uh, at posteriori in posse we, what they contain. And we use that to create this tool. And so that's it. If you have some questions, please do it. That's it. Thanks. Some questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. For example, when you want a runtime code on the kernel level, probably you will have kernel mitigation. So what are the prevents to linking the information through EBF? What are the prevents? Like what, would, what would you do if there is a leaking of your information? Also probably a 
escalation because you're running a runtime code on the kernel level. Let's say if you have a kernel attack, probably you expose all the information to leak. So what are all these steps that we can prevent? Because I work in PCI DCC. Yeah. He said this is with yeah. credit cards. Okay, yes. I, understand. <laughs> I know, yeah, I understood your point. Uh, I think I have to look more into the, the, this, leakage, uh, this leakage topic. Uh, so I don't, I don't want, I don't want to say stupid things, but I think that uh, they are not possible with the BPF virtual machine, how it is done. Because it's, uh, it has been done in a way that basically the only way to have data, data outside is with the BPF maps. But you have to know the BPF maps, and you have to have the, pro the, the tool to connect them. Otherwise, you cannot get nothing out of them. So I have to look more in this. Thanks for, for asking, because this is a cool topic. I need to investigate more. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Other questions? No other questions? Let's go drink, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.